Great. Oh, it's working. I nearly forgot to pick it up then. Um, nice to see a full house. Thank you for coming. Ellison, My Ellison, let me just... Oh, sorry. So, just, it's fine. It's fine. I did it wrong already. <laughs> We're just about to start, so okay. I won't hold you back okay. as my, for a long time. But welcome at Berlinale Talents. Welcome at Murder Management, Tension and Crime and Mystery. Um, we're, we're very happy to uh, start with this first session within the framework of the Drama Series Days, which have just started today at the festival at the European Film Market and luckily for us, here as well at Berlinale Talents. And we are happy to have Janke Friese and Baran Boda on stage, the creators of the first German Netflix series. And without much more from my side, please welcome wonderful moderator Alison Norrington. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I was just going to say anyway, so thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so my first question is, without embarrassment, who has seen the series Dark? Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, that's good to hear. Brilliant. Um, because we did kind of figure you would get much more out of this if you had seen the series. So I now have a magic clicker that I hope will do something. Will it do? Okay, that will happen in a minute. Okay, so of course you know that Netflix, um, Netflix is everywhere. So those of you that haven't seen Dark, you have no excuse. You can even watch it on your phone when you are stuck in a traffic jam. So you have no excuses. Um, but yes, I'm very excited to speak to Yantia and to Bo. Uh, Yantia is a screenplay writer and showrunner. She produced Bo's feature, The Silence, in 2010. She moved into writing and has developed projects for companies in LA and London. She and Bo co-wrote the screenplay Who Am I in 2014, which earned six German Film Award nominations, including the Best Screenplay. And dear Bo is a director and showrunner who made his debut feature The Silence in 2010, screened at numerous festivals, received overwhelming critical acclaim. He gained international attention with the cyber thriller Who Am I in 2014, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and became a box office hit. Sleepless in 2017 was his first Hollywood production, starring Jamie Foxx and Michelle Monaghan. Pretty damn cool. Okay, so Netflix, I just need to say, in 190 countries, just to give a sense of how far these things can travel, um, and our 117 million members, Dark premiered on the 1st of December last year at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's nominated for a Guimmer Prize and a Goldener Camera in three categories, which are the best series, the best actor, and the best actress. Those of you who are fans, which I hope are all of you, be pleased to know season two has been announced already on the 20th of December. And the show so far has been very successful internationally, specifically US, Brazil, Italy, Turkey, Spain, and France. I've been told there is a teaser that's been released for season two, which I believe covers from 1953 to maybe 2053. So there's a lot of time spans there to be covered. So welcome to Yantia and Bo. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. We're actually really open to taking questions from you guys too, because we have, like I say, a lot to discuss over these 10 um, episodes, but we'd like to take questions. So if you do have anything pressing, don't hesitate to put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you and we can make it a little bit interactive. So one of the things I love most about Dark is the blend of genres that are covered. We look at themes from love, relationships, truth and existence. And one of the key things I feel is that audiences are so, so smart now with some of the amazing TV shows, they recognise the blend of genres. It doesn't have to be just a straight genre. So my first question really would be, where did the idea come from? How did we get to this point? Do you want to quickly say how it all started? Yeah, um, so we are both, I would say, pretty lazy. Sort of, you are very lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually do have a lot of ideas that are floating around over years in wherever. I usually get my ideas while I'm actually on the toilet, <laughs> to be honest. Um, <laughs> and I'm more, I usually I'm more for the rough part. Uh -huh. And she's very much into details and stuff like that. And in another life, she would be a serial killer. And we are also a couple, uh, maybe just even to let you know, and we have a kid <laughs> together. But 
Um, actually, I was busy with, with my first Hollywood movie in the States when Netflix approached us um, as they saw our movie, Who Am I?, which was, a, as you said, a, a successful movie here, and as Americans love success, they run towards it. <laughs> um, but I was actually really busy because when I shoot that, then I usually don't, I can't concentrate on other stuff, so I kept saying no. Like, not regarding towards, I don't want to work with Netflix, but I just said, like, I have no time right now. And that's another thing that Americans really <laughs> hate if you say no, because then they get even more aggressive. Um, so, <laughs> finally, I got on the phone, and I, I'm, I'm really happy that I did, because it was really the best experience we had so far. Um, and they actually asked us if we want to make a show out of Who Am I? Uh, which is, who haven't seen it, a hacker thriller. Um, uh, set up in a hacker world in Berlin. Um, but Mr. Robot was out back then uh, mm -hmm. and have, has similar themes as our movie. And so we said no again. <laughs> that, and we also don't like to repeat ourselves. Um, so they asked if we have other ideas. And uh, I'm really good in lying. Um, uh, I was There's lots very of good. Tips here. Uh, I Say was no and lie. I was a really good liar <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid. So I said yes, of course. We have millions of ideas. So we went back and we said, like, well, what can we do? Um, do we have anything we can turn into a show? Because we we're coming from features. We never did a show or a TV series before. So we didn't had uh, we didn't have any show ideas. So we were working on a time travel trilogy back then, um, but like really big entertaining action movie and we worked a couple years on a show that was called Dark, or not a show, a movie that was called Dark that was based on uh, the real story of the serial killer Marc Dutroux who was a serial killer in Belgium in the early 90s which was really, 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 really dark as a story and I truly believe that creativity is always the combination of at least two things. Like, um, I always keep mentioning that example, if you take a chair, that's not really creative. And if you have an elephant, that's not creative either. But if you combine both, you can make s something interesting with it. You can put the chair on the head of the elephant, then it's funny, or you put the elephant on the chair, or you let the elephant eat the chair, whatever. <laughs> you, it, like, and that's how the whole idea started. We really combined these two ideas. We took the title of that dark movie, Dark, and said, um, let's combine a family drama in a small town where kids disappear combined with time travel. Fabulous. Wow. So, yeah, good tips. Keep saying no and lie. I mean, what more? But what making more movies need? is all about lying. Of course it is. And do you know what? You're right. The more you say no, the more attractive. I mean, that's the case in anything. That's in how life, I get right? all the girls at school. That's really. <laughs> always say no until. It took me a year, actually, to get him. And Are you serious? <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. So this is like a thing that actually does happen. He's the no guy, right? Okay. He's the no you guy. You persevered, though, right? <laughs> well done. And that's the other thing. You just have to keep relentlessly pushing. <laughs> That's also yeah. one of the tips if you want to make it, you just yeah. have to keep going. Yes, all right, okay. So well, I don't, do want to get into this and start looking at the structure because I think it's really interesting and there's lots of points in there. But my first question to you really would be in terms of Netflix came to you for this, right? Yeah. How long did it take you to develop that from that moment when he finally said yes? <laughs> So it actually went pretty fast. We talked to them, I think, in November, December or something like that. And Bo was still in post-production. I was still working on, a, um, on another script. And I think in February, we started with the outlines. Okay. Um, and then the writer's room already opened in April. Mm -hmm. um, so, and in, during that outline phase, um, we basically put together the, the main structure of it all. And the outlines were, um, they already had like 15 pages or so. That was, they weren't like just rough sketches. Um, mm -hmm. They were really the plot lines already um, in there. And um, we discussed them with Netflix and um, they brought in some ideas. And um, so it, it went really, really fast. Okay. It, it was a really fast process. But um, as intimidating as that might sound, I actually really think that um, time pressure really helps with creativity because yeah. um, you just need to make decisions and um, 
making decisions sometimes can be really, really tough, um, especially if you have too much time, because then you like venture out, okay, I could do it this way, and then you think about uh, how you do it this way, and then you, okay, but maybe I could do it this way, and then you, and then you find another way, and you will find hundreds of ways to yeah, tell your story, so right. you just have to be, you just have to make yes. decisions. So it's yeah. quite good to have that ticking clock. Yeah, right. I think okay. so. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things I love about this genre, uh, particularly, is that this, there was an old theory about philosophy between, sort of more back in the day, American cinema and European cinema, which isn't so true nowadays. But the fact of that, of this study, was that American cinema, you would enter the scene late and leave the scene early. And more traditional, old school European cinema, you enter the scene early and you would see the set up and you would maybe watch the murder, whatever, and you would leave the scene late. So you hang around in the scene for longer. I love this kind of storytelling because throughout, from what I've watched, you enter the scene late and leave it early, like really, really quickly sometimes, almost like little jump cuts sometimes. And the setup and the payoffs, there's so many. You've got so many characters, and even in that intro, there's so much going on, so many visual clues. So it would be nice if we could like talk through a little bit what you put together here in terms of the structure, and maybe kind of set us up um, with how you, you approach this. Please. Yeah, so it, it obviously was like a big puzzle. Um, and um, we knew that um, with that many characters and with that many twists we wanted to play, that it was really crucial to find out at what points do we re re reveal what and also what kind of false tracks to, do we lay um, uh, out. Um, so what we did first was actually come up with an episodic structure, um, which you can see back there, that just... Um, we felt like every episode should follow some kind of um, rhythm or some kind of um, structure that you also learn. Mm -hmm. So that when you um, watch it, this structure becomes really un unique for what um, dark actually is and you, you feel like you kind of know your way around so that you have some kind of anchor you, you can hold on to <laughs> <laughs> while, you, while you watch this. Um, and as it was, we always also said that um, the whole show should be a puzzle itself. So you, you get like little pieces of puzzles throughout, but sometimes you get something and there is maybe like a brown dot on the puzzle piece and you don't know, is that an eye? Is that a penis? Is that whatever, you know, but you, you, you have the clue, but you can't really, you know, place it anywhere. Um, and that was the, the really interesting thing in finding out when do you give those pieces of the puzzle to the audience. Um, and when does the next part that belongs to it that reveals whether it's an eye or a <laughs> penis, yeah. when, when, do you, when do you give that? Um, and um, so what we did was, um, after having figured out how we basically want to um, structure the, the, uh, the episodes and um, those 45 to 50 minutes that we have, because um, I'm always a big believer in, in finding the small in the big and the big in the small and that they kind of have to be the same. Um, we, we took this episodic structure and also stretched it out onto the um, season structure, meaning that wherever the reveals sit in the episode, if you would see the whole season as one episode, you would have the same kind of structure as well. So if you have a movement in an episode that goes, you would also have that in the whole okay. um, season. And um, because we've, we talked um, up front about how this is about secrets and how you, how you reveal secrets and, and how you put clues, um, uh, we thought it would be probably a neat idea to just take something out of dark and explain how we did it, like how, the, how we revealed something and then basically show you guys where we put the clues and what kind of different clues there are because there are like you can play a whole lot of different cards mm -hmm. um, and then um, I think it just explains it um, much better but uh, maybe just quickly when you when you look at that um, we work with a very um, traditional four act structure um, which most American um, uh, series do as well they, they either have four or, um, or six acts but it's basically the same um, it's just if you, sometimes you break up the first act into an A and B part and the last act into an A and B part and then you basically have six acts. Um, and so, so we did the same um, thing and we always have like an opening image that kind of sucks you in and we have the title sequence. Then we start setting up where the characters are, what their problems are, like status quo, um, what their plan is at that moment. Um, 
then once you enter um, Act Two, you, you like you put some obstacles in there, some antagonism, um, until you get to the to the big midpoint reveal where something big should happen. Like either it's a really big clue that has something to do with the mystery, the crime story, or it has something to do with the whole Greek tragedy, mm -hmm. who's having children <laughs> <laughs> with who um, thing, and. Then once you move forward um, from there, from the midpoint, things are really getting weirder and you can, you can tell how, like it's all accumulating. It's like everything is just getting more and more tense. Um, which brings us to the holy shit moment where something really unexpected uh, happens that, that like should hit the tone of what dark is. That kind of like makes you jump either because it's like just weird atmospheric stuff or it's uh, something weird that the, that the antagonist does, or uh, it's again some kind of personal entanglement um, reveal that lets you say, holy shit. Um, and then we move into the fourth act, which is basically you have some bridge scenes and then the music montage, with, which shows like the dark night of the soul, if you know that um, term of like, so what has all this holy shit stuff that happened, what has that done on a really like psychological level to the characters. And then of course you need to go out with something that makes you wanna keep watching. <laughs> so there's either another clue, another reveal or another secret so that you kinda like really wanna keep going. And, and if you look at that um, and look at the whole season, you'll find those exact same steps in the episodes as well. Fabulous. So you're all going to watch it again with a different viewpoint to look for these shapes, right? So shall we, um, I think we might move on from this and go to the clip. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we thought we wanted um, to just uh, do the midpoint reveal um, where we reveal that um, Mikkel is actually Michael. And um, so just to refresh your mind, we're just uh, going to show that and then tell you how we laid that out. Perfect. Could we do that, please? So, yes. <laughs> so that's your midpoint reveal, which if you didn't know, you might think would be the holy shit moment. But you have to know that this was once the end of season one. Oh, so really? It's, it's just to, put, uh, to add something what Jan just said. It's like, we throw balls into the air with some ideas or clues that we don't have the answers yet sometimes. And that was actually the end of season one. And we thought it would be a bigger wow moment if it's much earlier, because that would be a typical end of season yeah. one where you're like, okay, that's the big reveal. Yeah. Our problem then one was, okay, now we have a big reveal in episode five. What's the big reveal in episode 10? Yeah. But pressure is always good, so. <laughs> um, yeah, but like we're moving things really easy or don't stuck, uh, stick too long on an idea and just think it has to be there. It's really, as a tip, don't be afraid throwing balls into the air. And if you yeah. don't catch them, there are other balls, you know. Yeah, right. um, yeah I, um, I think like um, at least I live by the 70% rule. The 70% rule is that um, you should follow your own theories, structures, whatever, for 70%, <laughs> and then leave space really to be flexible and completely lose the structure again. And as you will find out, because that happens in editing as well, should you recheck on that what you just saw, the, the, the chart, you will see that not everything is in the place where it's supposed to be. <laughs> That's because of the <laughs> 30%. But it, um, what Bo says is really right, because if you lay it out all beforehand and you know everything beforehand when you, um, when you start writing, it will be really boring. Like, um, and you won't be able to pull off um, the same kind of surprises because you're not surprised yourself. But you have, like, especially when you write mystery, you really have to be open to what happens. Like mm -hmm. sometimes just those damn characters don't want to do what you want them to do, or you feel whatever you thought out beforehand just doesn't work and you have to be flexible to change it. Yeah. But I think you should stick to your plan 70%. As much as you can. Yeah. But I mean, I've found that too with things I've written which are nowhere near like as good as what you've done, but 
Sometimes the characters evolve into something else or something you've inadvertently set up is just an amazing payoff and you, you have to be open to those ideas as you go through. But I like the 70% rule because it gives you some kind of like It's path actually to a very good life rule as well. If yeah. you're 70% happy, that is happy yeah. enough. <laughs> That's a good way to be. <laughs> I like that. I, I know like we will have questions at the end, but I just wonder, as you've just seen that midpoint reveal with the context, if there might be a question in the room. Yes, can we? Oh, do you want to just shout it out? I don't know if it's mics. Oh, there is a mic that we throw at you. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Cube. Um, <laughs> So I, first, I just want to say congratulations on the show. Um, I, I love the way you bring Germany and America together in a way between those two worlds. Um, I was curious about your approach in the clip we saw to voiceover and text in the film, uh, in the series. I find it very bold. And how did you choose to use that kind of voiceover narration? And did you have rules for yourselves? And thank you. I know they always say don't use voiceover. It's like, it seems like a general rule, like when you go to film school, <laughs> everyone tells you, Voiceover is just the cheapest thing <laughs> to, to do. For some reason, we like voiceover. If you've seen Who Am I, it's like there is a whole narration that is voiceover. In that case, it is because it's an um, irreliable narrator, narrator, which is actually probably the best reason to have a voiceover if you think you can believe that person, but you can't. Um, but in that case, it was um, important to bring um, emotionality to um, the scene. And with Michael killing himself, early um, and not really having some kind of emotional connection um, between him and Jonas, it was just important to have him speak those words and have him be there actually with him even though he's not. Um, so in, in that case, it's, it's usually always if it brings emotionality in some way or the other, not so much like bringing clarification is important too, but if you find a way to bring clarification and emotion, that's just better. <laughs> Is there another? Just behind you, if you can throw the cube. Oh, you've got it, okay, thank you. Hi, um, I want to say I really love the show. Um, and I have a question before I come here, and now you kind of approved my question in a way, because I really like the structural analytical way this show works, and also I love how the clues are working in different layers. So I really watch it um, with the joy of watching something very clever. But also I was a little bit afraid that like, because it will be second season and third season. And I was afraid, oh, will it be like lost? Like, you know, this TV show lost at the end. So like there were a lot of stuff mixed together. And at the end you will say, oh, why? Why did you do that to us? So, <laughs> so, so but, but when you say when you are throwing well, like apples or balls, um, I don't know, are you afraid of the same stuff as me? For we, are, we are definitely afraid of this. We are <laughs> huge Lost fans. And you have to admit that at least the, uh, the first three seasons were pretty awesome. Yes, yes, they like, <laughs> And I think it's just like, I mean, we have ideas for three seasons for this show. But it's not like Lost where it's uh, at the end was seven or six, something like that. Um, but it's, I, I just think I'm, we were angry as well on, on Lost because it was the obvious idea at the end and you felt like well i knew that four seasons before and you were hoping for like an interesting reveal but on the other hand they delivered s really great episodes and at least three great seasons and i think it's just like life you will die and then you will realize oh, okay it's just that <laughs> so there's not a big life reveal so i rather have as i said before like three great seasons and then the rest is not so great. Um, but on this one, we definitely, and we spoke to Netflix about this, like we have ideas for three seasons because we don't want to create something too unsatisfying at the end. And I think that raises an interesting point. You and I had spoken about audience types. Um, and I wonder if you just might want to talk to that a little bit. Um, yeah, and um, maybe when we um, approach the clues is what, what you have to have in mind is that um, there are different audiences watching this. Um, not different audience in terms of where do they come from, um, but uh, 
intelligence, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, or uh, maybe not even intelligence, but as you said before, like people are really like, they've seen so much stuff now, they can read code, like, yeah. um, and you have an audience that is actually able to read genre code, like they see certain hints and they can immediately place or at least think they know what that means or where this is leading. But then you have also audiences, like people who have absolutely no idea. They don't know any genre code. So they completely miss all the clues all the time. Like they, they just, like they don't even see that they happened. Um, and so that is like the really difficult thing is to, um, to make it satisfying for all of them. Like that, that is actually the really tough thing. You want to have the smarties be happy, but you also want to have the people that take a little bit longer um, be happy and satisfied as well. So you kind of have to keep track of three different audience groups, like the, the smart people that can read the genre, that have like all the ideas all the time, and they, they, like, they, they watch the first 10 minutes and they can tell you <laughs> that's it. Um, and then you have like just your average um, uh, audience, and then you have like the audience that really needs to be taken by the hand. And um, to, to give hints and clues that satisfy all three <laughs> of them, that is like the really difficult thing. And relating to your question uh, in terms of season two, um, that was actually a big struggle um, for us when we started working on season two again, is that everyone in this room has expectations for season two. And when you guys talk about it, each single one of you will have a completely different expectation of what, what will happen. Um, so it seems like we can only fuck it up anyway, <laughs> <laughs> at least for 99% in, <laughs> in the room. Um, so th that's actually a really difficult thing, but what we found out during the um, process of now um, writing, and maybe you can, uh, you can add to that as well, is you really have to just shoot you all there's the serial <laughs> killer again, just <laughs> shut up! <laughs> um, because you have to find out again what you want to tell. And the interesting thing is that what we thought would happen in, in season two, what we laid out, we were already bored by it. We're already bored by it, so we've, we've done some, something completely different, which at the moment we feel it will be really awesome, but maybe you will hate it, who knows? But we have to have fun. <laughs> we have to be the ones um, having fun creating it, so. We are, we are always our first audiences, so we only do stories that we actually also would watch. And I think that's the only thing you can do. You can't predict what another person would like or not. Um, but what we also do is sometimes to set up um, puzzles or re reveals that we actually want the audience to know it up front. So it's for them satisfying, like, oh, I knew it's they're the same person, like, mm -hmm. and there's a, uh, there, something funny happened. There is a group of people that knew from episode one on that those two characters uh, are the same person, but they didn't know that Jonas and the stranger are also the same person, but it's the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. Or do you have the other group that knew Jonas and that other guy are, are the same person, but they were blown away by that secret. And there are really just a few, few people that had both Clues, though the mechanism is again the same that you show a person in different age stages. Um, but we don't do it like to be magicians that are like, haha, you didn't know it. Like, we want the audience to start thinking. Uh, that's why I direct many scenes in this, yeah, in this slow pace that people actually can breathe and watch something and start thinking. And I don't want to, or we didn't want to blend people by the editing and just whatever, yeah, hide the trick, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. I think that's a really good point. I was reading something last week and it was um, about teaching people to write kind of different types of genre. And uh, there's one guy and he said, the biggest illusion is that people say, write what you know. He said, that's bullshit. Write what makes you excited. Because if you write what you know, you become bored while you're writing it. <laughs> And the audience know you're bored, right? So that tied straight in with what you'd said, right? You've you already mapped it out. You were bored with it already. You've scrapped it and you've moved on to a new idea. So pretty cool. Okay, let's jog on with this a little bit. So this is uh, another video clip. This is the opening scene, right? Which I thought was really powerful. I'm sure you guys did too. Perhaps we could show it, please. Do you know what I love about that? Like. Everything's there. 
It does what um, great storytelling does. It's all there up front, right? So even with um, House of Cards in that first opening scene where there's like the car, the sound of the brakes and Frank Underwood runs out of the house and he's there with the dog that's been run over and he looks up to the camera and he does a two minute dialogue which tells you everything you need to know about that man absolutely everything but because we're quite disarmed that he looks at the camera and he's killing the dog we don't pick it up right it's only on retrospect you go back and go oh my god it was all there mad men does the same thing 14 minutes into mad men there's a character that tells you what the entire show is around so but then like you've done that there it's all there everything is there but only on hindsight you know how did you feel about that because are you afraid of that moment that you're laying it all out too clearly um, well, there are, first of all, there are, there are two things. Um, like watching it like this, watching the midpoint reveal, and then actually looking what the opening of the whole season is, I think really is <laughs> an interesting thing to see it that way because it is, it's all there. Yeah. Like they, it's like right in the face. But to be honest, it wasn't like that in the scripts. Okay. Um, it's something that happened in, in editing. Like okay. um, the pulling, pu didn't it? Yeah pulling the um, opening, like the bunker sequence up front before the killing, like the killing was always the opening um, that he commits suicide, um, but we didn't have the, bu uh, the bunker in, the, like in, in those very first seconds. Okay. But um, being in the editing room, um, we felt that it was the right thing to do, just to kind of set the rules up front, yeah. just to tell you this is about families, this is about how people are connected, this is about looking at characters in different um, age stages. Yeah, and even that voiceover at the beginning about, about linear and time, like it's all there, everything we need to know. But th there, there was always a voiceover there, also okay. in the script. We started on, uh, on a close-up on uh, television and our clockmaker, who was supposed also to have this science show, like a weird, creepy science show, t would have talked about time and what time is and everything is connected but we just realized you, you would start a show with a lot of information on the audio part and so the new thing is that we just decided to add images to it so it helps you to understand a little bit what he means with everything is connected and, you, and then you see characters in different age stages so you know oh it's gonna be about people yeah. in different uh, ages without knowing that this is going to be about time traveling but at least you know it's about that so that's the, so it's it was a little bit there, but not as it is at the end. Okay. So how does that make you feel about opening season two? Like, would you feel that you'd be that you know more that way? Because it's kind of scary. Because great stories make the audience feel like they're more clever than anybody in the story, right? Which is what Lost actually did in reverse, because we were equally lost as all of they were, <laughs> right? <laughs> but. So how how do you, that's kind of a brave thing like that would make me scared but I like it. I would have started uh, on Lost the second season really with a polar bear, <laughs> just like what he's doing just to know, and why yeah. he's there. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the interesting thing about um, season two is that I think people that watched season one now can read the code. Yeah. So you have to find a way to rewrite the code, or have the code mean something else. But you have you ha absolutely you can't do the same thing again. Like mm -hmm. it, uh, that would be so frustrating. So um, you have to find a way to be still what you are, but then again, be something else as well. Yeah, it's hard. The second one's always tough, right? Because the expectation is there, and you've got to now take it a step further. Yeah, but we're 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 over. Like we were in a hole, but we've already emerged oh, from there it. You go. So you're home and dry now, right? Okay. So this was about the foreshadowing um, with dialogue. Do you want to talk us through this? I think we can actually um, skip pretty fast um, um, through those. It's just about like how you set up clues and what kind of different clues there are, and what you ha and and also there are two things um, um, that are very important to know is there is um, a conscience level of giving clues, and there is also clues that just speak to your subconscious, like that even if you like when you rewatch it, maybe you wouldn't you don't even see it because you don't think about it. Um, that way and we come to one clue later um, but this one is just like just little hints are you sure he's not adopted it, like it doesn't tell you anything yet but 
again, it, he will be adopted at some point. He's not yet, but <laughs> not from this family, but just like trigger words that you can throw in um, to make in the end the reveal feel more like substantial and grounded yeah. and um, so there's levels of the clues there's like the subliminal very subtle clues yeah and then like right at the beginning where it's right up front but yeah. we still miss it right yeah okay so this I love this scene actually and I've got to say from a director's point of view I, I mean I don't I don't think we see all of it but the camera constantly circles that family group was that down to you Bo that, that this yeah. scene is yeah, yeah, brilliant. I, I, yeah, I love brilliant single shot. shots. Yeah, I love single shots because uh, I truly believe. I mean, uh, I'm a very visual director, and I, uh, I always wanted to become a painter. So images are very important to me. But I think actually the most important part of movies or whatever are actually the actors who have to play a character and make it believable. So I think single shots are the perfect version to show an actor yeah. in his perfection, because editing is again lying. You take a piece of that take and combine it with another take to create a moment or a situation that has to feel like in the moment, but it's mm -hmm. a fake, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's lying. And a single shot cannot lie. You have to shoot, and I think we shot this 27 times. I was gonna ask you I that, think. could you remember how yeah. many times? And that's take 23. That's cut into it. 21 yeah. or 23, oh, okay. yeah. Really? And then it's just like, and but like you, they get really frustrated or whoever like, because it's like small mistakes that, that kill a take, like yeah. one drops the bread or mm. the camera stuck at the door while trying to get uh, or fit through. But I really like that because it is challenging and, and, and shooting can be boring because you keep repeating stuff every time. So I think this is really for everyone great because once you actually manage to finally get that shot, yeah. everyone is like, after, I, I can imagine giving b uh, birth to a child <laughs> feels like that, but it's not, of course. But just more screaming, right? <laughs> um, and I know we don't see all of that clip in this one, but uh, for me, I went back and watched that maybe four or five times because of that very nature of the single shot, the way it worked. Everybody was just on point and on time. And on top of that, we've seen him just prior to this with the other lady. And then he's back in the family unit and so much is happening in just those few minutes. I thought it was very, really, very really well done. Th that shot is also a good example for setting up subtle <laughs> themes because it's of course it's great to show oh look all these actors are great and they can really act and it's almost like a stage play you just watch it but it also tells and that was uh, like we wanted to show the family together with not editing because there's visually if you rewatch the show you will see there's a lot of single shots people alone and they're yeah. not connected or not together in a frame and here as an introduction for the very first time of this family, we wanted to show an almost intact family working together and being all together, which will change uh, in the course of the story. So that was basically really the idea to have that in a single shot. It's really good. Even the way it goes round, it's almost like an invisible rope rounding them up together. I just thought it was genius. So if you get the chance to take another look at this um, scene, I highly recommend it because it, it, I was quite seriously impressed. But we don't watch that um, part for this scene. I think this is just these two at the table. But perhaps we could show this, please. Love it, thank you. So there is actually like uh, the obvious clue uh, hiding in here. You got a yellow cup that is 2019 and a blue cup that is 1986. Oh wow. And you have a, a little figurine moving from one thing to the other. Like, Obviously, you still like you won't get it, but it's like th that's that's the trick. We, we're going to play on you. So, something is going to disappear and show up somewhere else. So um, that is, that is like pretty upfront. But there is also another clue in that picture, and that's uh, Michael's costume because um, the, um, we see Michael hanging himself. It's the f like the first w dead body we see, and the next time we actually hint to something that has something to do with death. Um, is Mikkel. Now that is obviously very, like, very sublime. And but it, that is some, something when I um, say clues that just work on the sub subconscious level, that w it, it will it will work within you, without you knowing. But it will. <laughs> I think you're right. And I, I actually didn't even pick up the clue of the 2019 cup and the. Oh, is it 
doesn't say that on there. It's no, just like but the I <laughs> didn't. I didn't get that. I was more like, how did he do that, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, visual effects. So the the figure is still under the same cup. Okay. My daughter was the same. She was like. <gasps> I know, I'm a sucker for magic so bad. Like even yeah. really, really it's bad all magic. About lying. I'm so excited by bad magic. If okay. you if you would have <laughs> seen the real shot of Michael hanging, you would be really disappointed because you see two stuntmen with wires in the frame, like uh, walking away from him because of course he can't hang himself. Of course, right? <laughs> um, and he's attached to wires. But um, yeah, it's all about lying. Yeah. See, I was thinking of that too, like, and the legs were shaking. I'm like, oh, my God, how did he do that bit? I love that. Okay. Okay, so the visual double meaning. Do you want to talk us through this? Um, yeah, that's probably more for, for German people because I don't, it probably doesn't work for anyone else. But um, we have that chocolate bar um, that is called Twix, actually, now. But in the 80s, it was called, it's still called um, Raider. And um, so, again, that is also very sublime, but um, the idea is there is one thing that is still the same, it's still the same, but they just changed the name. Um, and that's actually something that I think when you click further on through, or we get to that later, um, but I'm gonna talk about it now anyway, um, that it, it comes again, like in there is a scene where um, a small Elizabeth is in the car with um, um, Charlotte and Charlotte gets the the camera from the road and she's um, Elizabeth asked did you steal that and she said no I didn't steal I, I just borrowed it and she says just because you call something differently it's still the same thing again that is the whole writer twigs just two things being the same thing yeah. but with a different name um, also Michael Michael they're not that different but um, yeah excellent so how about this one, the dialogue set up? Again, um, even if you're dead, you want to be found, that's just like, will he be found, will he not be found? It, it, ju it just adds to you kind of, it, it leads you to asking the right questions, Okay, I guess. I don't even know whether we should watch this because I don't think we have that much time left and I would rather okay. also have like people still... Okay, well maybe that's questions. a good point to ask, ask if there's any questions. Yes, of course there are. Okay, where's the cube gone? Uh, I just wanted to um, go further with the question that's like lost. I just want to know how far do you know ahead, like, at the, like do you know the starting point and the ending point of the whole series or is it something that can change at this point, like when you're putting clues and all that? Um, it definitely changes during every process, to be honest, like we start talking about an idea and we think where the season should end, then we start with the outlines and it ends with a different ending and doing writing the drafts it changes again and even doing pre-production we we like for example we edit the future um, very late um, it ended really in a different way and all of a sudden we felt like oh this is this is much more interesting to open up another timeline um, so it's 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 always a process I think but by knowing where you're heading to because again I think it's great that lost is out there and you're afraid <laughs> that we're becoming <laughs> lost you don't have to but it helps to understand that you need to know a, s a certain ending where it has to happen and I think they always knew their ending but the the the, the was it ABC uh, ABC I think lost is ABC mm -hmm they wanted more and more, you know, mm -hmm. because it was such a huge success. But I think they knew that it's going to be about this island is a metaphor of pre-heaven and they're all dead and it's about their sins and they have to deal with their sins. I think they knew that. It's not like that it was a surprise for them. And But then everyone knew it and they were like, shit, we can't <laughs> just say that. Um, and there's, but again, like there's a good example there too because throwing balls into the air, there's, the famous urban myth that J.J. Abrams ha uh, sat down in the writer's room and he wasn't there often. Um, but uh, they kept saying like, and then there's this island and then you have these characters. And then he st stood up and said, oh, sorry guys, I have to go to another meeting, but there has to be a hatch as well on the island, goodbye. And then he left and they were like, okay, a hatch, he wants a hatch. <laughs> and then you just start with a hatch. But that was a very interesting part of that show, I think, going down there and typing numbers. But it was not satisfying, of course, not to reveal what that number is. But again, that could be whatever, God or whatever. Um, yeah. 
Excellent. There is another question at the front here. Thanks. Can you catch it? Oops. Okay. Hi. <laughs> it works. Break it. <laughs> um, first of all, I wanted to say that I find amazing how you represent the, the, like the small town in Germany. I find it like very legitimate and I love it because it was like a long time that I haven't seen such a clear and good representation. Like sometimes uh, I don't know why some authors cannot be like uh, uh, faithful, faithful to this, uh, this small world and the small towns and uh, I found it also cool how you took this uh, like everyday life elements like the s uh, small town houses, the weather, the raining and you combine them and make this great atmospheric feeling for this creepy story. Like I, I come from South America, but I live in Germany and my dad was like, oh, this is so creepy. This is amazing. It's so, so gray, so dark. And I was like, well, this is the everyday life here. You know, <laughs> this is the normal weather. Like, yeah, my husband goes every day wearing the same clothes as Jonas to the work. It's like really, really interesting. And I wanted to ask you, how you took all these elements that are also probably something that belong to your everyday life or belong it or I don't know or you knew this and how you play with this to not fall into a cliche or something boring but making it like really bold and really authentic you know because it's not an American series it's not something that I would see uh, represented in another place and I mean you choose to make it in German you choose to take all these elements that really represent this this world the Dorf or the small town and I, I, I think I simply love it and I think that that's why it's the, also the success you know because it's very authentic um, I think the uh, that is like the number one rule is you always and we talked about that before, they mm -hmm. say um, you always have to write what you know. Um, so maybe maybe the word no isn't the right um, thing, but of course um, there is so much from the both of us um, in there. We both grew up in small towns um, and um, we both had our experience. Obviously, no one killed children in a bunker, <laughs> um, but there actually was a bunker. <laughs> oh, damn, I'm getting caught here. Um, uh, no, but there was a bunker. Like I was in a um, something like um, Girl Scout, and we went into the woods, and there was this hut where we always slept, and there was a bunker next to the hut. Mm -hmm. So obviously, yeah, the bunker and the hut. There you go. It's like, and and um, Bo's fa father worked um, at a nuclear power plant. So there's just a whole lot of stuff from us in there and what you have to do is whenever you do create something that is um, fictitious you have to still ground it in maybe not even experience that you experienced it in the same way but that you still remember the texture of it or how it felt how, how, how certain things felt to you so then you can take anything that's fictitious um, like killing people <laughs> and you don't <laughs> have to have the experience yourself, but you combine it with something else. Like maybe you put it in a room that you remember where the carpet was wet and smelled. Ugh. And then, and then that's where you take the authenticity from. I guess. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, but we also push everything. Like I think it's very bo or, no, it's not true because there are filmmakers who are very realistic filmmakers, and then there are ones that pushes. And I think the, 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 the interesting part is to be in between where you create a world that is believable but still greater than the real world. Because if you just want to, yeah, you go into at least into the theater to escape world. This is how I grew up. Like my favorite movie is Blade Runner. When I watched it and I was 12, I realized this is what movie making is, to create a world that I don't want to leave. I literally would love to live in Blade Runner, in that yeah. world constantly raining, <laughs> <laughs> uh, replicants, like it was so cool that I felt like, oh man, I want to live in this world. And that's, we're both very atmospheric people, like we love to create atmosphere because it sucks you in and it, yeah, like, uh, yeah. Excellent. 
Bose Blade Run Runner is my dirty dancing. Hey. <laughs> I <would> <laughs> I, I just <laughs> but nobody just gets left in the corner, in whatever, exactly right? The same. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, some questions over this side. Oh, you've got one here. Okay, yeah, no, go on. You have um, it. Thank you for the show, first of all. I'm from France, so one of the countries where apparently it was a hit. Um, I really love the details. I must say, I even Googled the pen used in 1986 uh, to be sure it was the right year. I love that everything is so on point. And maybe I missed something, or maybe I was just too emotional about it, but I was wondering why um, Michael had to kill himself at the beginning, even though if it's the same day, because we know that Jonas can meet himself. Season two. <laughs> You will get to know. <laughs> You're a step ahead already. <laughs> okay, um, I have a question about your working process because you told us that you, uh, things are changing during the writing, the production and so on. Do you constantly check if things still work out with the things that happened before? Because I think this is really difficult if you're changing stuff during the process. You, you always have to, to check if this still works out and this is what the people you call the smarties will do, they always check, uh, oh, uh, is this scene still working in retrospect? The, the good thing is that we're smarties too. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> sure about that. Um, no, I think you just, yeah, I mean, it is difficult uh, and it is different, um, for example, of making a feature film, you have more time for less, to be honest, like minute-wise, and this is really like a beast because it is almost like five movies and basically almost the same prep time you have for one movie. Um, but I think as long as you create a playground that works, you can change during weeks or days um, elements in the playground. You can't change the entire playground. You can't just say like, well, this show was something like this and now we <coughs> would want to turn it into a sci-fi thing that is in the future that would have killed everyone. But I think like, for example, I, I, I write down all my shot lists like weeks beforehand uh, and I go to the set and then I throw it away, always. But I, I just need to write it out so it's out there so I knew how I would do it but I get already bored by doing that. So I go to the set and then I do a rehearsal with the actors um, and then I just change it. But at least I know like, oh, I wanted a white shirt and then this close up and this, but let's not do it like this, let's do it differently. Um, so, yeah, I think as long as you pretend you know what you're doing, <laughs> it's good. No, but we Not also, we worked out, we worked out a um, process for changes during, um, during shooting. And um, that's probably what, what you're referring to, like, when you change something on the day, you kind of still have to run it against all ten episodes, because sometimes on the day something happens and like you just have to unexpectedly change locations or um, whatever and it as it is like one equ equation you always have to figure out whether that it is it still is there still a number coming out in the end or not um, so as it was our first um, uh, TV series we didn't know that up front but we, we learned during the process that we actually have every week we have to um, run through the um, pages for um, the next two weeks shooting, like we would be two weeks ahead of what we were going to shoot and then just read everything again and make changes again. Like we constantly, it was driving everyone nuts because there were like we did, I don't know how many rewrites on this if you count it like that because we then did weekly rewrites. Like we were just going like, whenever there was a decision on set, like a, a character decision, then you have to run through the whole character again. Hi, um, I, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, we were in a session yesterday with Tom Tickwer and he said um, that we're not making TV anymore, we're making long movies when we make television. And especially on a platform like Netflix where people are binging and watching an entire season over one weekend, I wonder, do you also plan, because you've got an impeccable episode structure, do you plan the whole arc of your series, of your season, according to the classic three-act structure, as you would do with a feature film? Do you 
do you think about what that experience is for the viewer from beginning to end if they're watching episode after episode? Um, I think um, um, features and TV shows are something completely different in terms of narrative structure. Mm. Um, I think what is right about what, um, what Tom said is that the approach in filming it is nowadays like a, like a feature because you don't shoot one episode and then you shoot the next episode, but you break the whole thing apart and shoot off locations. So th that's the same approach. But in terms of, um, of character arcs, um, feature films do something completely different because they close, they close an arc. Like um, you have yes. a, a character that is in some kind of um, predicament, like he, uh, he doesn't see who he really is and he d does stuff wrong and he needs to look, take a deep, uh, like take a look into the mirror, find out who he really a uh, is and then either change for the better or the worse. Mm -hmm. That's what movies do, always, nothing, nothing else, that's the thing. And in t TV series, if you want, especially if you want to go through um, different seasons, um, it's more like a loop. Like um, you have a character in the same shitty situation, and uh, it, he bumps up against obstacles, obstacles, obstacles. But he never ever gets better. <laughs> Usually, he just gets worse. Like when you look at Breaking Bad, it's just going. It's a downward spiral. You have a loop that is going down, 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 down. Um, but um, I think the, the way you need to work character arcs is, is completely different to what you do in features. Yeah, I think uh, series are really more realistic because most people don't change and are repeating their mistakes every day. And I think uh, feature films are more like the dream world of, oh, a guy who couldn't love can love at the end, you know? And I recently watched Sopranos, which I think is one of the best shows ever. Uh, and Tony Soprano really doesn't change. In seven seasons, he still is this <laughs> awesome <laughs> prick who kills people and cheats and lies. And, and he's still lovable, though. But still lovable, lovable because you, like you can ending? identify <laughs> with him because you're almost the same, except that you don't kill people, but you're lying or whatever, you yeah. know? You do stuff. And so... Yeah, I think it is. It's, yeah, just I think it is different. Mm -hmm. But I think Tom meant really like how he it meant looks in the, in the and feels. In the process of making it and what it looks like on screen. Yeah, but that was for That's us the same. It felt like a ten-hour yeah. movie we were making on yes. set as well. Okay. Um, um, I just have one more question, and I'll hand it over to someone else. I'm just curious. We're talking about <laughs> revealing secrets. Um, when you were developing and making the show, how much input and oversight there was from Netflix? Did you guys have complete creative freedom, or was there was there input from from <laughs> executives? Um, yeah, we had, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, it was really the best experience we had so far, work-wise. Um, uh, they really let you do whatever you want, by but they're giving you notes and comments, of course. You know, yeah. they still pay for stuff, uh, and and and, but they always ended every discussion we had. But you're the showrunners. So if there's something we didn't want to change or move into a direction we didn't want, they, they said, okay, that's fine. That's fine for us. We just mentioned uh, some people might not get it or won't understand it because of the language and stuff like that. It was basically those notes. It was not like, ah, a little bit more love would be great or I don't know, mm -hmm. something like that. They, they knew, uh, they bet on these two filmmakers. The show is called Dark. It's mm -hmm. set up in Germany, children will be killed, and there's time travel. So, yeah. That sounds ideal. There's some questions behind you, if you could pass it back, please. There's a great book written about the Tony Soprano thing called Difficult Men. Did you? It's excellent, isn't it? It's like Don Draper, Tony Soprano, these guys that we really like want to not like but we do because we recognize the flaws. It's interesting that because what it's really about the book is about the difficult showrunners behind. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> behind the <laughs> There's plenty of them. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, how and uh, when did you came up with the yellow color? Like the idea of just repeating in different places. And uh, what, what kind of decision was it? Um, more close to the shooting? or directly in the beginning of your uh, outlines? No, this, uh, this is something that actually happens during prep, I would say. And, and the idea was to repeat uh, the nuclear power plant can 
uh, yellow that they usually use to also again in a subtle way tell everyone this is also about about nuclear energy or stuff that is happening with it so it's basically that's the reason I'm really fascinated how different I saw Marseille a Netflix series in uh, France and I saw dark and actually there's a huge difference I really like dark more because it's <laughs> just for me it's just a round thing and yeah I my little other question was how is um, shooting with the actors do you do you tell them everything you know about the series and or the season um, or do you just don't tell them just to make them bring them in a different mood um, no as we shot not in an episodic chronological way but in a location chronological way as we pretended it's a long long movie mm -hmm. Um, they all knew the ending, for example. They, they, so, and but for them it was really hard because, especially um, Jonas, who is going through all these big secrets, he's revealing during the the ten episodes. He sometimes had scenes like three a day that were like from episode one, five, and ten. So, uh, my father killed myself. My father is my neighbor, and I'm, I will end up in the future, <laughs> and that stranger is me. So. That was really tough for them sometimes, uh, but we created this kind of a character arc document, so everyone had all his scenes in a, in a chronological way, so they could always look up, like, okay, where I'm coming from, and what do I know, and what I don't know, because mm. they had to act, of course, I don't know that Miklas Michael. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I have a, a question about the size of your production team like on a on a on a show like Lost they had different directors coming in every week they had ma showrunners were a, was a special responsibility but your show running your directing your writing your producing how, how else did you get something like this done at such a high quality with such a lean operation um good question <laughs> i don't know every time i ask myself how we did it again sort of because we didn't we didn't have the money as whatever, a big US TV series, but we had more money than a normal German show. So it was good to shoot it here because then money means more here. And the crew was pretty big, to be honest. It was about uh, 200 people constantly. And with if you count the extras and whatever, then it was over 300 and 350. So it was really big for Germany, but not as big as any US show. Um, but it's, I think it's all about planning, a lot planning. Like if you don't have the money, you need time. And we had a 12 week prep, but honestly we had a soft prep of 12 weeks. So it was 24 weeks of prepping and going through stuff, going through the numbers, changing scripts, drafts, like, oh shit, we can't pay for this. So how can we d deal with that? Um, going on locations with the head of departments to look at it and say like for example it looks simple but just lighting up a forest at night by not creating like there's like creating a non-light is really difficult like there are huge uh, lamps hidden everywhere to, cr to 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 light up a forest you know so you have to plan that because you can't just go there and throw money on it but you have to plan that for weeks to get there Sort of, um. But also I want to add, I think it would have been a terrible mistake if um, we'd had more directors um, on it um, because as it is so complex, um, you, everything falls apart if, if there is not, um, if there aren't two people who still get it all. <laughs> and if you just think about it in little chunks and you make small dis decisions, like everything can like, well, it, it, it just gets really difficult. So. Um, I think it was actually the the smarter way to put the workload uh, on on ourselves. <laughs> Great, thank you. Hi, um, I have a question about the music and the sound design. Because how did you came up with that? Because I thought in the beginning it was really in front, and then um, when the episodes followed, uh, it was more in a yeah in a flow for me. So I was wondering how you came up with that. It's funny because we had we didn't change uh, regarding that 
uh, question, we didn't change anything. Each episode is mixed in the same way and has, I would say, the same amount of music. But I keep hearing that, that for th at the beginning, people always felt like, oh, that's a lot of music and it's loud. And then <laughs> at the end, like, I was less, but it's not true, it's actually the same. But uh, that was actually a really uh, a longer struggle, to be honest, in post-production. That was one of the only struggles we actually had on this show was like to find the right voice or music because we tried stuff and it just didn't work. And, and it took a lot of time during the editing process um, because it makes the editor frust uh, frustrated, it makes us frustrated. Then sometimes we said, okay, let's just watch it without music, but it's, it's really brutal to watch a uh, rough cut with no music because you don't see it. You, you just feel it's the shittiest thing ever. <laughs> and then one of our editor um, used music from the show Fortitude, and that was Ben Frost's score. And we looked him up and read he's Australian and he li uh, lives in Iceland. And we felt like, well, pff, not sure if he's available or whatever, but let's just try and ask. Like, he, all he can say is no. And we were lucky because his girlfriend is from Berlin and he said he has time and we Skyped and uh, we fell in love because he, he is this Viking guy and he has this beard and he saw my beard really literally and we fell in love like <laughs> immediately and he is as dark as we are and it was really the first time that I or we had a composer we fully trusted we we barely gave him notes we gave him the episodes without the music and said like, just do what you think you should do. And then he came up, I think, with really intriguing, interesting pieces. And regarding why it feels loud or a lot is because we just love music. We just love it. And um, if you, again, watch Blade Runner, this is mm, very yeah. much up front <laughs> and very loud. Yeah. And it is, I don't know. And, but there are people who don't like that. You know, and I and, and I get it, but I'm sorry, we're the filmmakers, so it's gonna be loud. And just like I want to make even more music and be even more loud on season two, just to whatever. But it will not be like this, I promise. Thank you. Great, maybe I'll move on a little and we'll take some more questions. We've got about ten minutes left. I'd like to show the last clip because the last clip is lies. And this is, of course, all about secrets, but with secrets always come lies, right? Am I going backwards instead of forwards? I do believe I am. Is that lies? Episode two? I don't know which one, which one was the one you wanted to show. There's the one. That I don't know how they labeled them. I no, I don't either, and I don't know how to go back. There is the, um... Here is the episode two, I'm sure it was. This one, because like secrets don't, with secrets always comes lies, right? They go hand in hand. Yes. So I wonder, could we just show this, please? Uh, the final one, the very last one, please. Thank you. How to tell a lie without saying anything, right? <laughs> I mean, this this one is also when you know it, then yeah. it's like really obvious. Yeah. Like Excellent. Yeah. Is there any questions down the front here? The back, maybe we go to the back first. Yeah, um, I was wondering, since you're working with America as well, if that created any obstacles? If there's something, because European cinema and American cinema is quite different. So I was wondering if that created some obstacles for you, or you were not able to fulfill exactly what you wanted. I haven't seen it, so I was just wondering. Um, no, I think it's more and more blending together to be honest because the world is we were uh, yeah it's getting more global and global and especially netflix as they are running in all these different countries they are not a company for example that are creating american content and then are just happening to sell them all over the world but they actually realized oh half of our subscribers are american the rest is the rest of the world so we have to think of both and that's why i think netflix is so exciting right now or or at least that kind of a distribution idea that it's not, as I said, just movies made for the American market and then they show it everywhere else, but now it's really thinking about the global market and what people in India like or Germans. And just the success of this show 
shows that people are happy to watch everything as long as it's good and they don't care where it's from. So I think that's, um, so it's, it's not so much different if that answers the question, to be honest. Thank you. And I was saying to Yentia, there was somebody I spoke to yesterday who we were talking about dark. And they said, oh, that's the uh, TV series that made the German language cool in America. <laughs> and I was like, well, they didn't know about German before this series. <laughs> but now it's cool, apparently. There's a high demand for German teachers now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, there's a question down the front, please. Can you catch it? Okay. Um, so um, I'm not quite sure if I got this correctly. So you outlined the, um, the plot. And then you gave it to the writer's room. Um, that is question number one. Question number two is y you guys do it as a team, which makes sense because you can bounce ideas off each other. And if you get stuck, you just have a second brain. Um, but um, I was wondering, especially when you write something like this, like Mikkel, no, dead. So when it becomes really obvious to you, when is the point that you invite outside opinions because you like, you no longer you get like um, blind to the content, and if it's like too many hints, if it's too little hints, if it's too obvious, when? So basically, did you do it all by yourselves, and um, when do you invite outside opinion? If not, um, honestly, we don't like to invite outside opinion that <laughs> much, um, but it happens. <laughs> um, so. Um, it is, it's really difficult because I think sometimes outside opinion can actually really do damage. Um, and um, so the person who gives you their opinion really needs to know what they are doing. Um, and I, like, I get really frustrated with um, lots of um, producers that don't, simply don't know what they're doing. <laughs> um, be, because like giving, giving notes is not about um, personal taste. And if the person who gives me notes doesn't understand that, that this is not about what he or she likes or feels or... Um, I just think that it just ruins stuff because it, it plans something in me anyhow. Like it, it does something and that can be damaging. So the person who gives notes um, needs to know that what is the show, what does the show need and how can I provide for the show? And if that person who gives notes doesn't do so, then I'm quite reluctant to take notes. But the good thing is that at Netflix there are actually people <laughs> who know their, know their shit. Um, so that was, it was the first time though, I have to say, it was the first time that I ever got good notes. Um, and that was with them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So just to clarify, you did write it all by yourselves? No, um, we, as you said, we had, um, I wrote um, the outlines um, together with Bo. That was like mm -hmm. a really intense process uh, until we really had the, what we wanted to tell. Um, then we had a writer's room um, and they did the first drafts. Like they basically went from the outlines to um, the drafts. And then I took over again because mm -hmm. what just, um, what just happens, and I knew that would happen with that show in any case, is that um, you really need some kind of homogeneous feeling and you don't get that with different voices. That might work on other shows, but I don't think it works on this one. So um, there, it, it was just obvious that um, you, you take what was ever, whatever what was good from those um, first um, drafts, but you also throw away a lot of stuff and then just try to find like really one round narrative that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Question at the back. Hi, thanks. Um, as you were just saying that um, today these shows are globally made or made for a global market. At the same time, I would argue that people who go on Netflix, they want to see something from a foreign country. So basically, Netflix was asking you to make a show as a German TV producer. And if you brought something German DNA to the show that would be valuable in other countries too, what part of the German filmmaker D the DNA would that be? Um, 
we don't think like this, to be honest. We think about stories. We think about um, what story we want to tell. The only thing I can answer to that question is that we shot it in German. We shot it in Germany with a German crew, with German actors and German scripts. But it's not like that we try to have a German DNA and show the world. Or if I don't know if I got your question right, but if that was the question, then we don't think about it that way, to be honest. Maybe I can, of course there is um, an attractiveness to local content because um, people do want to see something else than just the states. They do want to see um, what's going on in different con countries. They want different settings. They, um, so there, there is obviously like people want to watch other stuff, but um, the way that we, like we never thought of it as a German show or as a US show, we just thought of, of, of it as a show we would like to watch um, that would be shot in Germany and how would we do it and how, what, would, what would we like about it? And that's actually really what we did. We didn't think about how can we get Japanese viewers, like what do they need or how do we first get the German audience? Like um, that, was, that was never, like there wasn't. Like a natural outcome. Yeah, yeah <laughs> probably. And you have to know that the world didn't wait for a German show to be honest, mm. because uh, especially in America, and I'm there often, it's not like that, oh yeah, Germans do really great movies and really good TV shows. It's the obvious, the surprise is interesting. A lot of people say like, oh, what a great show, and it's from Germany. <laughs> like, so, yeah. <laughs> We're good in football. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more question, if there is one more question. Down the front here, please. You have to be a good catcher, though. There you go. <laughs> um, I guess it's fitting, but could you talk about the opening credit sequence and like how you came up with the idea of mirroring and doubling and what images and why you chose those specific images and just more to that? <laughs> <laughs> he said I'm the lazy one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, well, the first title sequence idea was actually to work with the black ink idea. That there's black ink creating a tree and the connections. Um, and then we felt, and this happens really late in post-production. It's not like that you have a title sequence up front. It, it actually happens during editing process that you start thinking, okay, what could be the title sequence? But you wrote a title sequence with ink, I think, in the scripts already. And we, during the editing, we felt like, ah, it's too romantic, it doesn't really fit. The black ink was a bigger part of the story, but at the end it wasn't anymore. So we felt like doing those split screens, we realized, oh, there's something interesting in combining a picture uh, that uh, looks like a mirror. And then we were looking for artists who were doing this title sequence, and in a funny way, without telling them, uh, one of them uh, came up with that idea that he felt it should be mirrors, you know, and he we gave him some images and he created these, I think, really beautiful uh, images, and it just fit so well to this show that things are simultaneously happening and are also weird, so it's a combination of these pool of things, I would say, yeah. Cool. Well, that's exactly 3.30. That's very, like, German precision in timing, <laughs> which I'm not usually very good at. Um, so I'd like, firstly, to thank all of you for your questions. It's always great to get questions from you guys. I'd also like to thank both of you for taking the time out, because I know you're... Did you say you were shooting season two in June? So you must have so much going on. So thank you for taking the time. I'm sure we all wish you a lot of success, of course, with the next season. And thank you to Berlinale Talents as well for giving us the opportunity to uh, have this discussion. So thank you. Thank you.